So when Gary asked me to be a discussant for this session, I was pleasantly surprised because I don't work on South Africa nor Latin America, but also I was very pleased. I was very pleased because the three papers we've seen are from bodies of literature which I greatly admire. Uh, Carlos's work with Luis Felipe, Nora Lustig, and others have been very important in the World Bank and labor, understanding labor markets. Gary's work, of course, not only the Latin America book through UN Wider, but also the work, the book that he mentioned earlier and everything else he's done has been fantastically influential in my own thinking over labor markets. And of course, Harun's and his colleagues' work in UCT is the best work among the best work I've seen on labor markets in the global south. So a chance to reflect on these three papers is a, is a great uh, opportunity really for me. Um, I'm going to make some overall remarks and I'm going to try and get to a synthesis and then think a little bit about what does it mean for other uh, middle income countries. Um, just to kind of sort of, you know, be clear about the comparative dimension here. We have three presentations which examine the patterns and determinants of inequality in middle income countries, Latin America, uh, uh, several Latin American countries in, in uh, Gary and, uh, and Carlos's case, and South Africa and others in Africa. And of course, you know, these two regions, if you wish, or well, one country and one region, provides interesting contrast, really, because we see, as we can see from both Gary's and Carlos's papers, that there's declining income inequality in, in Latin America and increasing in South Africa. So clearly the question is, why do we see these differences? So what role did patterns, economic growth, national policies, labor market institutions play in these divergent trends? And of course, what lessons can other con MIC countries in particular learn from this country experiences? Um, I was asked by Guy not to get into paper by paper, uh, but I can't sort of just now say one or two comments about each paper from a methodological point of view. Then I'll get to the synthesis and the thing. The, and so the methodological points. I was not so, uh, sure, Carlos, in the decomposition you did, that essentially when you're looking at a wage decomposition, a kind of blind over how can if you wish, if you're saying residual inequality explains most of the wage inequality, where are the coefficient inequality, coefficients coming in there? Because you've already shown that a lot of what you're seeing in Latin America is a decline in education premium, a decline in experience premium. So pretty much isn't that what's really driving the, dry, the decline in inequality? And so what is residual inequality here is, is that rest, famous residual we have in the TFP case, which can't explain anything. I would like a little bit more structure on that. So I wasn't sure methodologically um, you know, that was very clear to me. Uh, on Gary, the point here I would say is that, you know, if economic growth is not really driving poverty declines, um, we see a big weak correlation there, but mean in earnings is, what's driving mean labor earnings? I mean, what else can be, can be the causal factor behind the increase in mean labor earnings? So I wasn't very sure what, how that comes into play here. On Haroon, uh, I love the RIF approach. We are great admirers of Sergey Fipro's work. But I just wonder, the circuit purpose and the approach you used kind of puts, you know, the very nature of the approach puts everything in the coefficients. In a sense, you, what I, I mean, so when you mimic the U-shaped distribution, the wage distribution using the RF approach, and you get pretty much a clear kind of fit between the in coefficient effect and, and the actual distribution, and nothing much in the on the uh, characteristic, characteristic side, I think why would that characteristic effect have any role to play? Because you can't imagine compositional changes in characteristics really being important in the in the weight in the U shape UI distribution. So almost is it by default, tautologically, that you're putting everything on the coefficients. So I can't, you know, I'm not very sure uh, how to think about that, but it's worth thinking a little bit about is there a kind of problem here in the way we use RIF regression? So I'm not an expert in this, but perhaps it's worth thinking about. Okay. So on the synthesis side, um, what we really see clearly are labor market institutions matter a great deal in explaining inequality movements. Again, I, you know, there were still things I wasn't very clear about. Pattern of growth mattered more than the rate of growth in South Africa. Very clear argument here about the fact that we have this service sector growth that's fueling polarization, uh, at, at least on the top end, and also manufacturing hasn't really done well. But in the case of Latin America, I wasn't very clear because the rate, the rate of growth doesn't seem to have a fate as Gary shows, but what, about, what kind of pattern of growth do we see there? Because we haven't seen manufacturing there at all. And it's been mostly commodity-driven growth in Latin America in this period in most countries. So I wasn't clear about the pattern of growth story when it came to Latin America. And a similar problem with the skill bias technical change story here because it seems to play a different role in Latin America than South Africa. Why? I mean, skill bias technical change should really be driving up inequality in pretty much every country where it's open, opening to the world. Latin America has been globalizing too. So I wasn't sure why is it that we see the decline in the education premium happening in, South, in Latin America, while clearly in South Africa, it's what we expect has been increasing inequality. So it's something that I, I wasn't very clear about. And also feel that the, even the question of the education premium falling in Latin America, 
I mean, it needs to be thought through a little bit more carefully. Is it due to less demand for skilled workers, or is it increasing supply of college-educated workers? Very different implications, right? So again, we need to think a little bit more carefully about why do we see this counterintuitive uh, decline in the education premium, which is not what we see in most other countries where I've seen the data on. So that's something I couldn't really understand. And finally, I would have liked a little bit of sense of the role of trade. Uh, have stop for Samson effects been more favorable in Latin America? In the 2000s, we've seen earlier work by Nina Pavnik and others where they see, show the stop for Samson has actually had unfavorable effects in, on wage inequality in Latin America in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. So, you know, what is, what is trade playing in this story? for South Africa and also for Latin America. It wasn't very clear, and we know globalization is a big, big thing here, both in driving uh, through the Samson effect, but also through skill bias technical change. It wasn't very clear, so I wanted to get a sense, better sense of that. Okay, so possible lesson for other MICs. Um, you know, it's interesting, the Latin America story is saying that it's possible to increase, in, uh, in, possible to reverse increase in inequality, the appropriate government policies, particularly minimum wage increases, which we see, certainly have seen, in, in Latin America and South Africa also, as also as everyone has uh, shown to us. But you know, a word of caution here, you know, it's possible to increase minimum wages when the economy is doing well, which is what we saw in Latin America. We had reasonably strong growth in most countries. Not so clear like right now, as you see growth essentially declining for many of these countries. Is it possible to keep on following the same policy? So that's not very clear to me. So again, I mean, on the same point, while national policies may have mattered the decline in inequality in Latin America, Strong growth fueled by the commodity boom in most countries, not all Latin American countries, may have provided a favorable environment for the redistributive policies that they followed, whether it's Bolsa Familia in, in, uh, in Brazil or Progreso in Mexico, and also the minimum wage policies. Now, maybe the world is different now. And if that's the case, what can governments do in this, in this region? Something that, again, I think is worth thinking about. The other thing I thought was interesting, especially coming from, uh, uh, from a perspective where I work, work mostly on India, that the pattern of growth seemed to matter really in the South African story. We see a stagnant manufacturing sector, along with the growth of the two-tier service sector, a high-end service sector, and the low-end service sector, which has been fueling which polarization in South Africa. And if I had to think about what I would take from this presentation in the countries that we are, the other MICs, I would say the South African story is probably more what we might expect. Because many of these countries in, in the emerging world are also going through premature de deindustrialization or tertiarization or financialization, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so in a sense, the South African story may well be mimicked by other emerging, emerging economies. We don't know because we don't really have the kind of data sets that Harun has been working with in the case of South Africa. So, you know, if I had to sort of think what, is a, uh, what are possible indications, while I think there is a role for government policies in the right, in the right moment, in the right economic environment, you could do something like increase minimum wages if that's possible to implement in your country. But also I think that what we might expect to see is more and more the story that Harun has been saying in South Africa in most other middle income countries. Thanks. Thank you.